testimony through the through your word. Um, we just pray, Lord, that um, that we would be receptive to whatever it is you want to say to us, and that um, when we leave here today, we'll be able to say that something's changed and that um, something has been done in our hearts and lives that will last for eternity. And so we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please watch the screen. of our adventures in finding alternative ways to worship together. The last little while, we've been uh, including in our congregational readings and the things that we speak together um, some American Sign Language. And that serves not only to help us to begin to learn some of a language that we might not otherwise know, but it also helps us to slow down and to think about some of the key words in, in the, uh, the, the readings and the ideas that we're examining. Um, today's word, you may already know this one, is thank you. This is a good word to know in any language. Gracias, merci, thank you. And um, apparently, I'm, I'm learning as we go. Apparently, if you want to say thank you to more than one person at a time, or if you're really, really, really thankful, deeply thankful for something, um, you use both hands. Thank you. Thank you. So 
we're going to have some slides on the screen. And um, Nathaniel, just so you know, when you go to the first one that says uh, autumn colors, at that point, it, they should run through automatically on a timer. So you don't have to do anything until we get to that. Just once we're on that slide, you're, you just... Oh, okay. So just, yeah. So just go back up when we start. That's fine. And as we go through these slides, if the slide shows something that you are personally thankful for, um, say thank you to God. Or say thank you with both hands. Or say it out loud. I'm sure God would love to hear some voices raised. Yes, sir. Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, okay. So hit escape. Then click on the slide before the one that says autumn colors. Should be. Oh no. We want. Oh yeah. That. Don't worry about that. It, it, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> and then hit F5 again, and that should bring us back to where we want to be. Maybe, theoretically. <laughs> okay, uh, talk amongst yourselves. Are we thankful for technology? Everybody say, thank you, God, for technology. Because I'm personally not at the moment. So that's good. Okay, so away we go. Take it away, Nathaniel. We're all walking together up that hill. The day long gone. And the bonfire still Smoke in our hair will be there when we wake the moon dances behind us on that little lake Like the children dance in darkness safe surrounded Someone's got the porch light on Walk up that hill now Sons and daughters The breeze blows in from off the water It's been breathed and breathed and breathed again And spoken by the dreamers and the doers and the broken We're all children on those shoulders Riding high into tomorrow And someone's got the porch light on We're all bricks We're all stories, toolboxes, smiles and feet We're all paper and we're scissors We're salty and we're sweet and we're tired And we're thirsty, we are water and we're rest We are trying hard and stumbling We're all shining and we're best and we're building a kingdom, we're setting it free. I am building you, you are building me. While we walk together up that hill, the day
Like the children dance in darkness, safe surrounded, and someone's got the porch light on. Let me read to you Exodus chapter 32. Um, we don't have our Bibles in the pews, but if you've got it on your phone, you want to follow along. Exodus chapter 32, starting to read at verse 1. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, they gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, we don't know what's happened to him. And Aaron answered them, Take off the gold earrings that your wives, your sons, and your daughters are wearing, and bring them to me. So all the people took off their earrings and brought them to Aaron. And he took what they handed him and made it into an idol cast with the shape, in the shape of a calf, fashioning it with a tool. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. And when Aaron saw this, he built an altar in front of the calf and announced, Tomorrow there will be a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people rose early and sacrificed burnt offerings and presented fellowship offerings. Afterward, they sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go down, because your people whom you brought out of Egypt have become corrupt. They have been quick to turn away from what I have commanded them and have made themselves an idol cast in the shape of a calf, they have bowed down to it and sacrificed to it and have said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. We'll stop at verse 8. Lord, thank you for your word. As Grace has said, the word, just as it, as it is brought to our memory many times during the day, it teaches us, it helps us, it strengthens us. And I pray, Lord, that you would use my weak words to demonstrate your strong words and uh, that you would speak to us in a way that would do something significant in our lives. Lord, please give me the strength to do this and take this time as yours. Do whatever you'd like with it. In Jesus' name, amen. So there was a time, a moment in their history, when the people of Israel, God's chosen people, made a decision that instead of worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they would worship a calf, a golden calf statue. Now, we read of many ancient societies who would worship inanimate, ob inanimate objects and treat them as deities, which was not something that the children of Israel had really been prone to up to this point in their history. Yet in this instance, they convinced their leaders to make a golden calf for them to worship. A calf, not a mighty lion or a powerful dragon or a majestic elephant. They made a calf of gold, and they all worshipped it, declaring that this was their God who had delivered them out of Egypt. Now we can look back at this story in Exodus, this ancient story from our sophisticated vantage point in the 21st century, and think that we would never do something like that. We could even look down on the children of Israel for worshipping a golden calf, I mean a calf made of gold. Why would I ever praise or celebrate or give honor to such an inanimate object, a calf? I would never bow down to a golden calf. But the real question we want to ask ourselves this morning is, what's your calf? What's my calf? Now, the context of the story rests in the exodus of the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. God had performed many miracles to bring them out from under their slave masters. And now he was leading them into the land that he had promised them. And in their journey, they had reached this place called Mount Sinai. And it was here that God summoned to Moses to, to come up to the... That Moses was the person that God had chosen to be the leader of the Israelites. 
And he summoned Moses to come up to the mountain and meet with him. And God's intention was to give Moses the laws by which he wanted his people to live. The laws which would protect his people from making harmful decisions. The laws which would enable his people to live together in peace. The laws by which they were to praise and honor and worship and thank God. Now this conversation between God and Moses on the mountain took quite a long time. It doesn't say how long in scripture, but we do know that the people were getting anxious to get on with their journey and to exercise this newfound freedom that they had had, and, and they began to grow restless. They had followed Moses up to this point, and they had obeyed his leadership, and they did what he said, but now he'd been gone for so long, they were starting to have their doubts. Now, they had experienced many different unusual circumstances in their lives as a community, and, and Moses and the leaders always told them that these events were happening because this was God at work in their lives. And, and, but the people had never actually seen God in the flesh, this God they called Yahweh. This was not someone they could see with their eyes and touch with their hands. I mean, sure, they saw the powerful things that he did, and, and all these things were to their benefit. But I guess where they were right now, that just didn't seem to be enough. And so as Moses' trip up the mountain stretched on and there was no sighting of him up in the mountain, many began to wonder, well, what's going on with Moses? What became of him? Perhaps he just, you know, bailed on them. He's, he's taken off and hasn't, hasn't told them. Perhaps he slipped and he fell off some high slope and he's lying there dead, impaled on some sharp rock. I mean, he said he was going to talk to God. And we agreed that we would do whatever God told him. But that was such a long time ago. Are we supposed to just sit here and wait forever? The people of Israel became impatient. They wanted answers, and they wanted answers now. And they wanted to deal with the God that they could see and hear and touch. So they told Aaron, who was Moses' brother, who Moses had left in charge while he was gone up the mountain, they said to Aaron, Aaron, make us a god. And so he gathered all the gold jewelry that the people had, he melted it down, and he fashioned with a tool a statue of, of a, a god for them. He made for them a calf. Now, we, we would never do something like that, right? Or would we? What's your calf? There may be times when it's hard to trust God, because even though we can see his impact in the world and his impact in our lives, he's still a God that we have to follow by faith. He's not a God we can physically see or audibly hear or tangibly touch. And so we don't, though we don't want to turn away from that faith in God, we figure, you know what, I better have a backup plan. And we begin to put our trust in those things that we can physically see and audibly hear and tangibly touch, like our money, and our possessions, and our government, and our talents, and our own abilities. Or we look to tangible things to make us happy, and to fill our lives with distractions. Things not necessarily bad in themselves, but things which become the focus of all of our time, and all of our attention, because they're right here. I can see them, hear them, touch them, and they provide enjoyment. There are times when it can be difficult to trust God because, well, he's just taking too much time. And we get impatient. Why haven't my prayers been answered by now? Why hasn't that situation worked itself out? Why hasn't my pain and suffering stopped? It's been years now. And as life goes on, we begin to realize that God doesn't always work according to our timetable. Our five-year plan that we set up of what we wanted to accomplish and where we wanted to be by now, a plan that we might have even willingly said, here, Lord, this is for you, this is your plan, it hasn't really panned out, maybe, and, and we get impatient, and we snatch the plan back into our own hands, and we begin to life, live life according to our own timetable. If things aren't moving forward fast enough, aren't moving forward the way I want, then I'll just do things my way and build a calf. What's your calf? 
The calf that Aaron built for the people of Israel was not simply a nice make-work project while they waited for Moses to come down from the mountain. It wasn't something that was to serve, you know, just as a symbol of something to remind them of something important of their lives. They made this statue to literally be their God. I mean, they declared as much when the statue was finished. And as their God, they ascribed to it all the credit for delivering them out of slavery in Egypt. This golden calf, which they had just finished creating themselves, was, according to their new way of thinking, completely responsible for bringing them out of freedom and into freedom and out of slavery a number of months ago. They forgot the fact that God had performed 10 miracles, had inflicted 10 plagues upon the land and the people of Egypt in order to convince Egypt's stubborn leadership to let the slaves go. They forgot that when the pharaoh of Egypt had a sudden change of heart after letting the slaves go and decided, you know what, I'm going to go after them and bring them back to Egypt, they forgot that God had performed the miracle of parting the Red Sea so that the children of Israel can go through it and be free from their captors once and for all. They forgot that when they were starving in the desert, God provided them with food, a bread-like substance called manna, which fell down from heaven and fell like dew on the grass every morning that they can gather for themselves. And he provided them with meat by allowing quail to literally just fall dead into their camp every day. Every week, the people of Israel always had enough food, and all they had to do was pick it up. God provided it for them, but they'd forgotten They forgot that when they were faced with a hostile enemy, the Amalekites, that God promised victory in the battle. And all they had to do was have Moses sit up on a hill and raise his hands in worship to God. And as long as his hands were up, the battle was won. And he got, after a number of hours, he got tired, and two of his leadership came and held his arms up, and the battle was won. They forgot that they agreed to let Moses go up to Mount Sinai. And and they heard the promise that that Moses would come back with a special word from the Lord for them. They forgot all that God had done for them. They took all of God's blessings and all of God's protection for granted. They no longer felt the need to give praise and worship and thanks to God for what he had done for them. Instead, they directed their praise, directed their thanks elsewhere and they built the calf. What's your calf? It's easy to forget all of the good things that God has done for us in the past. We can sometimes take a, well, what have you done for me lately kind of attitude towards God. Do we take him for granted, just assuming that he will always be there for us, but then neglect him until we really, really need him? which in reality is kind of a dangerous position to take for the more we neglect God, the the less we realize, the less we're willing to admit that we actually do need him. And we end up finding ourselves in over our heads before we even consider the thought of calling on God. On this Thanksgiving weekend, do we really give God all the thanks that he deserves for all that he has done in our lives? Should we perhaps take the time to look back on the previous chapters of our lives and recognize the huge part that God has played in our lives to bring us to where we are today? At the very minimum, to thank him for the cross, to thank him for our salvation, to thank him for the opportunity we have for forgiveness from sin and release from its power and its grip in our lives. Do we live lives of gratitude and thanksgiving to God, or or do we sometimes direct our thanks elsewhere? Are we apt to kind of look for, I don't know, earthly or logical explanations for things that could only be really explained as an act of God and an act of his grace and mercy? We hear people who aren't Christians often will say, oh, thank God, and more as an expression And in our desire as believers to simply not use God's name as just an expression, we instead say, thank goodness. Maybe we need to make thank God a part of our everyday language, part of our everyday lives, and and, and mean it with all of our hearts. We need to make thanksgiving to God an essential part of our lives. For without it, we begin to take God and his goodness for granted. 
Without it, we'll be drawn to direct our thanks and even our praise elsewhere. Without it, we'll build a calf. What's your calf? Once the calf was built and presented before the people, Aaron made a proclamation. He announced that the next day there will be a festival to the Lord. It's hard to wrap your head around what Aaron was thinking here. The people had specifically asked him to make a new God for them, a God separate from the God Yahweh that they had been following. And when the calf was finished, the people proclaimed that this God, this calf, was the one who had brought them out of Egypt. And yet Aaron said, we're going to have a festival to the Lord. Maybe Aaron was realizing that, you know, things have really gotten off the rails here, and he was trying to somehow bring them back. Maybe he was trying to convince himself and the people that, you know, we've actually done something right here. And so he says to everyone, let's have a celebration in honor of God. And let's do it by presenting burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, just like we've always done to God in worship and the offerings that God has required. And let's do it on an altar, just like we always have, but let's do it on an altar in front of this calf. This calf that everyone is now acknowledging is their new God. But hey, Aaron says, let's do this for the Lord. And so the festival starts off okay. They make their offerings, but it isn't long before it becomes a celebration of self-indulgence in many destructive ways. It looks nothing, absolutely nothing, like any other festival to the Lord that they may have had before. But they convinced themselves that they were honoring God by what they were doing. They convinced themselves that they were doing this for God, even though their focus, even though their attention was not on anything that had to do with the real God who had delivered them from slavery and protected them and watched over them. They put a godly face on what they were doing, but the real reason for their festival was that they had built a calf. What's your calf? In today's postmodern relativistic world, it can be easy even for Christians, even for people who follow God, to convince themselves that right is wrong and wrong is right. We can slap a godly veneer on our actions and make them look acceptable. We can convince ourselves that God is actually pleased with our decisions, but if we're truly honest, if we really listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, we know that we were created for something else, for something more. We know that our sinful decisions are leading away from God's purpose for our lives. We know that our wrong actions and behaviors, even if we try to put a spiritual face on them, are the opposite of what God would want us to do. But, but, but we're doing that thing. We're, we're acting and behaving out of love. How can anything out of love be wrong? Well, well, God, well God understands. God understands how lonely I am. God understands how poor I am. That, that's why I do these things. I mean, he'll understand what a tight spot I'm in, so he'll understand why I can't tell the truth. But, but God wants me to prosper, says so in his word. So it must be in his, his will for me to accumulate wealth. Even, even though others go without, I have to prosper. But it's right for me. It's right for me to vehemently condemn sin and others, to look down at others, to keep them at, ar at arm's length so I don't get polluted from the world. Though, you know, i got to admit, it's getting harder and harder to see that speck in someone else's eye when I got this annoying plank of wood in my own eye. As this world seems to unravel, there are more and more situations where wrong is called right and right is called wrong. What one generation tolerates, the next generation celebrates. And even in the church, we can fall prey to that line of thinking from time to time. And even worse, we can fall into the wrong is right trap and falsely call our change in thinking, our change in belief, a move of the spirit. We can take our preferences, our own choices, our own philosophies, our own behaviors, and call it a festival to the Lord and stick what looks like a godly stamp of approval on it and end up building a calf. What's your calf? Now, there's an interesting conversation that takes place between Aaron and Moses a few verses after the ones we've looked at. Moses comes down from the mountain, and he sees that the people are engaging in this drunken, self-indulgent party, 
as they sing praises to the golden calf. Now Moses was angry. God was angry. And Moses took the, tab the tablets upon which the, the commandments from God had been written and he just smashes them on the ground into pieces. And he, he takes the golden calf and he throws it into the fire and melts it down, takes the ashes from the golden calf, throws it into the water supply and makes the Israelites drink it. That's how angry he was. Then he turned to his brother Aaron, the one that he had put in charge, and he gave him the third degree. He said, how could you let something like this happen? How could you have led the people into such sin, into such rebellion against God? Now Aaron, he thought about this. He knew Moses wasn't going to be happy, so he had an explanation ready. He says, you know, these people, they're prone to evil. In other words, you know how awful these people can be, no matter how hard we try. From the very start, Aaron attempted to pin it on someone else, the people in general, rather than on himself. And Aaron said, these people, they wanted me to make a god, so I told them, well, give them all, all of your gold jewelry. And I threw the gold into the fire and out popped this calf. Now, in the passage we read earlier, it was very clear that Aaron fashioned the calf by using a tool. He made it a very active thing. But that's not quite the story he gave Moses. The basic premise of his story is, not my fault. It was these people who were so prone to evil that pushed me into, not my fault. I just threw the gold into the fire. Who knew this golden calf would pop up? Not my fault. Aaron was trying to shift the blame. He was trying to escape responsibility. He was trying to lay the fault at the feet of someone else. He was unwilling to accept even partial guilt for what had happened. He was saying, it's not my fault that we built the calf. What's your calf? It's not possible to be a Christian and take an it's not my fault attitude towards life. It's not possible to be reconciled to the God of the universe, to repair the broken relationship that we as humans have with God by looking him in the eye and saying, it's not my fault. Now, that doesn't mean we have to take ownership for all of humanity's sins. There's no need for that. We have more than enough sins in our own self to take responsibility for. The Bible says that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It says there's no one righteous, not even one. We're all at fault for the things we've done that have missed the mark, missed the mark of the plans and purposes that God has for our lives. We are all at fault for the things we've done that have hurt others, have hurt ourselves, have hurt God. It is our fault that our relationship with God is broken. And until we're willing to recognize that, until we're willing to accept responsibility for that, then that relationship will never be restored. For God has provided a way for that relationship with his creation to be restored. He, through Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for our sin on the cross. He took everything on himself that was my fault and your fault, so that if I believe in him and ask for forgiveness for those things which are my fault, then I will be forgiven. Those things which are my fault, those sins will be washed away, and God will forget them. He will no longer see them when he looks at you and me, and that relationship will be restored. Here's the rub for so many people. In order to ask for forgiveness from someone, you need to be convinced that you've wronged that person. And if everything is not my fault, then we'll see no need to ask for forgiveness. And so many are not willing to admit that it's their fault. And even we as Christians, sometimes we have a hard time admitting that it's my fault. And then we wonder why God seems so far away. The first step to reconciliation with your Creator is to admit that your separation from God is your fault. And then let it, rather, rather than letting that truth you know, beat you down in shame, because that's not God's purpose, you take that truth and you turn to a gracious God and you ask for forgiveness, and he gives it. And from that point on, God will reside in you by his Holy Spirit, 
and he will begin to help you to live out the purpose that God created you for. But for many people, guilt, the idea of fault, is an unhealthy concept. Sin is not real. All of our actions and behaviors can be explained away. And we staunchly proclaim, it's not my fault. And we build a calf. What's your calf? You know, I could have listed many specific examples of what our calf could be, but I really didn't. Because human nature being what it is, if I gave a whole bunch of examples and they didn't line up with your experience, the tendency would be for us to wipe our brow and go, phew, at least he's not talking to me. But the unexamined life is not worth living, I think it was Aristotle who said. And God calls us not to be, you know, belly button gazers and so enthralled with self-examination that we descend into self-loathing. That's not what he's calling us to do. But he does call us to examine our hearts, to examine our motives, to lay those before him, and to let his Holy Spirit lay a finger on what needs to be changed, to see, as the psalmist said, to see if there's any wicked way in me, to show me if there's any place in my life where I may have built a calf. The story of the Israelites and the golden calf shows us some situations that we can easily fall into where we could end up building a calf in our lives. We can get impatient with God and try to do things our own way. We turn to our own timetable for life and, and away from God's, and we build a calf. We can take God's goodness for granted, neglecting gratitude and thanksgiving and, and turning our attention to the things of this world instead of the things of God, and we build a calf. We can, call, we can fall for the world's argument that wrong is right. We can dress up sin in a godly package and try to convince ourselves that this is what God wants when we know that's not true. We can make excuses for sin, even call it a move of the Spirit, and we build a calf. We can deny that anything is our fault. We can point our fingers at people, at pressure, at society, at culture, and say, they made me do it. They're at fault for our actions, our sinfulness, and we, we lay that at, at their feet. But it is, it is only in accepting fault that we can find forgiveness and peace with God. And until then, we're just building a calf. What is your calf this morning? Burn it to the ground and praise and worship and thank the God who made you, the God who loves you, the God who has a plan and a purpose for your life, the God who wants every part of you, and the God who wants to give you every part of himself. Would you pray with me, please? With our heads bowed and eyes closed, just so we aren't distracted by anybody around us, what's your calf? What are the ways that maybe you've been impatient with God? What are the ways that maybe you've taken him for granted and neglected being thankful? Have you kind of slipped into a thinking that things you used to think were wrong, now you're thinking, well, maybe it's right. Maybe God wants it that way. Are you somebody that keeps responsibility at arm's length and say, says, it's not my fault? And even if you're not like that all the time, are you like that towards God? Because the paradox is, as much as God wants to give us life and joy and peace and a life that we were created for, there is that painful part, just like birth is, is a painful transition, the new birth can be, is a painful part to it where we have to say, okay, God, it's my fault. I'm guilty. But you know what? If you just ask him, forgive me, sorry, can we make these things right? God is much more gracious than any of us. He will say, yes, I forgive you. Let's move on together. Take a moment, just you and God, in the stillness of this time. Talk to him. Let him speak to your spirit. Let him show you where your calf might be. Let him show you how to get rid of it. Take this moment to make this personal in your life.
God, we know that we can be so oblivious sometimes. People of Israel were just so oblivious to what they were doing with this silly calf. And Lord, we can be so oblivious sometimes to the things that we've let into our lives that have become like golden calves that are taking us away from you and from proper thinking about you and proper thinking about our own lives and take us away from the plans and purposes that you created us for. So Lord, help us to be aware. Give us the courage to knock those statues down. Give us the courage to turn to you, to seek your forgiveness, to seek your strength and your help. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying on the cross for us, for paying that penalty so we don't have to, and we accept that. Lord, may we always be thankful. May we never take you for granted. Protect us, Lord, from becoming oblivious. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me, please. Let's mask up. We're going to leave in a second. For these reasons, each one of us has reasons that we can give thanks to God on this Thanksgiving weekend. For some of us, they're obvious. They're just right in front of our face. And others, we may have to dig a little deeper. But take the time this week to, to examine your hearts and your lives and find reasons to be thankful to God. And take the time this week to examine your hearts and your lives. Look for those calves. See if they might be there. And then work together with God to remove them to see how it is he wants you to live. Because he'll do that. He will. I have no idea what the weather's like outside. Normally we've been kind of gathering outside to visit. We can't do our usual coffee time, which we really, really miss. But if the weather's nice outside, you can go outside and stay physically distanced and visit with each other. 